Uh, if you open your Bible to Acts chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 47, I just want to shoot a uh, one verse there in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. You know, uh, Acts 2 is uh, gives the right recording of the day of uh, Pentecost when Peter preached the message and about 3,000 souls were saved at one particular point. And if you go through that book of Acts, you can count up uh, about 50,000 people having been saved in Jerusalem during that period of time. And this is the reason. In Acts 2.47, it was a continual uh, thing because the Bible says they were praising God and, and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They were rejoicing. They were enjoying the privilege that they had of uh, spreading the gospel. I'm talking with you this afternoon about some things concerning New Testament church. Some of you already certainly know. Maybe others you don't, but stare enough your fear of mind, I guess, as the Apostle Peter put it. The church is the bride of Christ, of course. It's, uh, it's his body, his mouthpiece on planet Earth. It is made up of lively stones. You, me, people who are saved, true believers, who have been added to it by being scripturally baptized. And she carries a torch for her groom, her groom here on uh, this earth until he comes back. You and I have a privilege to be a member of Washington Straight Baptist Church or whoever, whatever church you're a member of, if it belongs to the Lord, you're privileged to be a part of that and to carry out his, be a part that helps to carry out his work both here and abroad. The most important thing is, in my opinion, is to know who really is the founder of the church. Uh, we have hundreds of churches in the United States. I don't know about the rest of the world. Uh, that uh, Some of them put the name of Christ on it, but if you follow their History, if you look back to time, you'll find a man or a woman started. And it's always there. You just have to go back looking and you'll see who started the Methodists, who started the Catholics, who started the Church of Christ. The name's there. It was always a man or it was a woman. Now, if a man or a woman started the Baptist church, then it really doesn't belong to the Lord. But we, we have Bible proof, and, and I have to say, <coughs> if you believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God, that is, has no fault in it, it's God's word, then you can look at it and study it and rightly divide it, and you can know what the church is, who started it, when it was started. And even a lot of Baptists, by the way, say it started on the day of Pentecost, but that's not true. And I'm going to share with you in a moment why it, that's not true. <clears throat> but if the founder, of course, is in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and tells who the founder is, he said there, Jesus is talking, and he's talking to Peter and I'm sure the rest of the apostles. I say unto you, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And it's, as Charlie constantly points out, it's important to understand words to reading. And so when we look up the word Peter, we find it's a little pebble. A little rock, a little small pebble. But when we look up rock, it comes from a totally different Greek word meaning a boulder, something that can't be changed or moved. 
And so Jesus is saying, pointing to Peter, you're the pebble, I'm the rock. And up on this rock, I, talk about himself, will build my church. So the Lord himself is the founder of his church, and he, he started it while he was here on earth. Before uh, he was crucified and ascended back into heaven. And here's the proof, if you follow with me, in Matthew chapter 10, and verses 1 through 5, here's the first ones that he used to start his church. And that's in verse 1, it says, And when he had called to him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast out, cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the Republican. You knew he was a Republican, didn't you? <laughs> Matthew, the publican. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Libius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas his character, who also betrayed him. These twelve, Jesus sent forth. Well, you say, that didn't say that they, that's the beginning of the church. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And that's where we know that the day that he chose those 12 men, that's when the church began. And Jesus is the one, and, that's, and Matthew, by the way, is not the only place uh, that gives these 12 names. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it says, And God set some in the church first, apostles. And then it says, secondarily, prophets. And, and thirdly, teachers, after that, after that miracles, and gifts, and healings, and so forth. So we see from this first verses, the 12 names, and that the Lord set them in his church, or that the, the beginning or the founding of that church. And 1 Corinthians 3 9 says, we, For we are laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry, you're God's building. In other words, He has chosen to set His church up. He's the head, we're the body. The church, the body of Christ, has the responsibility of, like a farmer, doing the work here on earth. And we are God's building. And Ephesians 2, 19 and 21 says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the buildings fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. We're not to certainly get this church mixed up with the beginning of some sect. And uh, I was talking to someone recently that said, well, I'm certainly not a Baptist. I said, well, I certainly am. And a strong believer that the Baptist church is the bride of Christ. That he started it. He found it. You know, himself. And uh, I don't know of any other that I would even attempt to say has anything like the church he started. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, he said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That is a verse that we need to memorize. Nail it down, say, I'm going to follow this verse. 
this church, I'm not the authority in this church, I'm the leader of this church, I'm the pastor, but you have authority to make decisions that will honor God. But we're not to divide. We're not to <coughs> do anything cause division. Uh, we're to speak the same things. Uh, there's some method things that we may have difference of carrying out the same things, but we speak the same truths and the same things. That is, if we want to honor God. In John 17, 21, it said, this is the Lord's Prayer, by the way, that he's talking to the Father. He said that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Why? That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The church has actually been a lot of damage done over the years by churches having divisions and fighting. I think I said something this morning in our Sunday school lesson about how important the church is and how we need to not ever knock it. I'm not in those words necessarily, but to let it, to be, let it be known that we are to be in unity. Uh, if we want the world to believe that God sent His Son, then that's what they're looking at. And that's what His prayer was, that, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. Now, the church started here on the earth uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ, but uh, I think I've got to try uh, 50 days after the crucifixion, resurrection, 40 days after the Lord was ascended into heaven. So if I got this a little bit off, 50 I know is an important day, day of Pentecost. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, baptized that church. Uh, that's the day that it received. The church itself actually was empowered to do the work of the Lord on the planet Earth. And that's when the church actually began to go in forward and, and went in great numbers of people. As had won a lot. We know there was 120 in the upper room when Christ instituted the Lord's Supper. That was the church. We know they were there. We know the 12 apostles were in that group. But on the day of Pentecost, when these same people, on the day, uh, same preachers, Peter, the other apostles, uh, when they received the Holy Spirit that actually baptized the church, not individuals, but the body of Christ, Peter of the whole group stood up and preached them a really a message that either you like it or you didn't like it. And on that's the day that 3,000, about 3,000 souls were saved. And Acts 2 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000. Uh, so here's the point you can't add anything to something unless there's something already there to be added to. And the verse says, The same day, that is, on the day of Pentecost. There were added unto them. Who's the them? The church. That day, the church began to move forward and become big. And having staff been established on uh, on this particular day, um, the church began to gather and become well known. And that is the day uh, when persecution began to be formed against the church. Uh, you read the book of Acts, you find, I think it's eight chapter that they were scattered. Persecution was a big thing because the church, was, uh, religion doesn't like the church. Religion People that are really religious are going to always speak out against the church. 
the root of the Lord's church. It's doing what the Lord wants it to do. If you don't do anything, no one's going to say anything. You know, ain't got anything to say. But if you're working and God's moving, then the devil will go to work through religion. He, he has his religious spirit. But they began to become well known. John 20, 22 says, and, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, but received you the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And that, that's, the, that's where uh, they were willing to follow the Lord in baptism. And then they were praising God, as verse 47 said, and had faith with all the people around. In Colossians 2, verse 7, they were rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. We've been uh, quite a few times that we've said how important it would be if all of the Baptist church here, Washington Street, would hear the doctrines that are being taught on Sunday school. I do not believe most people and a lot of our church people really know what a Baptist church is or a church. But if they would be listening and hear, they know the church, they know the doctrine, they know what, what to do, what not to do. And then, they, you know, the Bible says to know the truth and the truth will set you free. And they'd have that pleasure of freedom, knowing that they're right. And not saying, well, that's what the preacher preaches, or that's what the Sunday school teacher teaches, or so and so believes, that's what the Bible teaches and that's what I believe. And someone asked you, what do you believe about something? And don't tell them, well, Brother Earl believes this. You're not, that's not your convictions. You have to have your own personal convictions. Or you will be what? You'll be tossed to and fro by every wind and doctrine. You have to study, show yourself approved in God, work when that needs not to be ashamed. Charlie can't teach you and make you know. You got to get in it yourself and say, "I, ah, yeah, I'm gonna get back into this for me." And then you will be sound. Uh, we're in the end of time, and there's a lot of teaching about the universal church, uh, and there's a lot of Baptists that absolutely have gathered it and began to believe in that. Well, I don't believe in it. I know there will be one big church one day when the Lord calls all of His churches that are here on the earth home, and it will just be one then, and it will be well known. But there's, when we look at the foundation of the church, we already said, the Lord said, I'm the rock. I'll build on me. There's only one article in the creed, and that's Christ. First Peter, First Corinthians 2, verse 2 says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There's one thing that needs to be accepted in this particular verse is that you don't need to go tell everybody how all the doctrines. They need to know it. Make sure they know Christ and him first. And then secondly, if they find that they do, then make sure they know they need to be scripturally baptized. Those two things are very important in their life. Not just to be saved and go to heaven, but to be saved. And baptism does also save you, as the Bible says, it's talking about the power of sin. They need to be a member of the Lord's church so they can uh, have that deliverance from the very power that sin has on the life. Not the penalty. The penalty comes through accepting Jesus Christ as personal Savior. That takes care of the penalty. He paid it. But baptism adds you to the church and being a member of the church 
has you in a, a, a position where that you can be delivered from the very power that sin can have on you. So it's important. Those two things are important and not everything else. You know, sometimes that's what I think uh, when you teach somebody beyond those two things first, that you actually just putting putting it out before swine. It's going to be trampled on, made fun of, and so forth. So they don't even really need to know that yet. They, all these other doctrines, they just need to be sure they know Jesus Christ and Him crucified and secondly, if they do, that they need to follow Him in scriptural baptism. 1 Peter 2, 7 says, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. As I said, methods may differ, and they do, is how you get something done. Uh, I was uh, seven and eight years old when we lived on this one particular farm. My dad was sharecropper, so we moved uh, at least four different farms that I remember. And when we lived on this one, there was a man and his wife that had a tractor and uh, a trailer that he, I guess he hauled hay of a flatbed trailer that pulled behind that tractor. And they lived about three miles from this church. We lived about one mile, and they would come by with that tractor and have uh, bales of hay, you know, on it. That was the chairs. And, oh, that was fun. That was the first bus ministry I know of, but we rode that trailer to, to the church. He, by the time he got there, he would have a trailer load of people, you know, going to the church. That was a method of getting us there. And uh, then it changed. Uh, <coughs> my dad got an old, I think it was a 41 Chevrolet. I don't know. It was a Chevrolet with knee action. I don't know what year they had those. And we could all crowd in that old Chevrolet and ride, you know. And, uh, he let my dad didn't go to church, but he let my brother drive it, and one of, one of the older brothers, and that was really a good way to go to church. You got there faster than you did on the tractor. That was another method of getting us there. Different things like that has changed over the years. Uh, whereas many years beyond that, everybody had to either walk or ride a horse or something to church like that, animals. I mean, methods is not going to hurt anything as long as they're not un ungodly. But doctrines must always remain the same and not be changed. As uh, was pointed out this morning's lesson is not, and I have to tell you, I've never ever in my 41 plus years seen any division in the church over doctrine. It's always some method. Some, something that don't really even count. Doesn't matter. But because of maybe lack of growth, kind of like kids who, I've seen this over and over again, you have too, a kid that have a toy, have three or four toys right here and know when I wear and they want that one. And they go over and try to take that one away from that one and they start fighting over that one toy, you know? And that's the way church people do over some trivial issue. <laughs> Something that really doesn't matter. Instead of being like Paul and Silas in the message this morning, praying and singing and praising God and bringing glory to Him, they're fighting each other and causing division in the world, saying, look at that. They call themselves a church. They call themselves a war church. Look at them over there. Isn't that a sad case? Well, yes, it is. And the Lord's ministry is hurt when it's like that. So when it comes to the Lord's church, you know, we need to be pulling together and working on the same foundation with one mind, one mouth, one speaking and saying the same thing. But 
different methods. You know, I don't care if you want to walk the church, okay, but if you want to ride a horse, it's okay too. I thought about selling everything I had, buy me a horse and a saddle and a, one of those little pop-up tents and just go around the country and become one of those circuit preachers in my last days. <laughs> There goes that old gray-headed preacher, look at him, he's about to fall off of the horse. <laughs> I just thought that, but sometimes I can think something get over it in a hurry. Because I just think it real quick, it may rain or snow, and then me be out there? No. There's some fundamentals of the church. In Acts 2, part 2, it says they continued steadfastly in the apostle doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayer. First of all, Christ. That's why we're here this afternoon. We're here for Him, we're not here for us. But secondly, if we're to spread the gospel, you know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you also you have received, wherein you stand, by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. And you know the only way you can believe in vain is just an empty belief. The only way is that you just do not believe in the resurrection of Christ. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the God. First, it's Christ that we're worshiping, that we're here for, and this is why we carry it out. This is the only way they can be saved. They have to hear it in order to believe it. And that's why Paul was saying and, and, they, they, uh, and preaching. And then we see in this church, and I mentioned it earlier, in the 8th chapter, that they went everywhere preaching the gospel. It, that 8 chapter verse 4 and 5 therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them and when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ they were baptized of men and women the church won on things fundamental there was only one Lord there's only one head of this church. Sad to say, <coughs> over the years, deacons and preachers fight each other over this, you know, a church as though it belongs to them. It should be working together in the office that they've been set in to carry forth the, the Word of God so that the world can hear it and believe it. But a lot of fighting. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, I read that a while ago now, and it you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I mean, I know this to be a fact, that whenever the church votes on something, I've always tried to say, do not make it a political issue. This is not political. We believe in church authority. Whatever the church decides, I may not even agree with what they decided, but I always said, if they're the ones who made the decision, I'm walking with me. And God honors that. Moses, you know what? They wouldn't fall, <laughs> they wouldn't listen to him. They spent 40 years in the backside of the desert when they could have been in the Canaan land all that 40 years. What did he do? He stayed with them. He might not have, he didn't agree, but he stayed with them. That's the point. We're still one walking in the same direction. The church had a zeal. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. In Acts 8, 4, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word of God. 
they went out under the Great Commission. They were given authority. I, in Mark 16, 15, it says, it said unto them, Go in time. Uh, <coughs> all the world and preach the gospel to, excuse me, <coughs> to every creature. And that's the authority that we have. <coughs> excuse me. They went everywhere though. Uh, the apostles didn't go with them. The, tw the twelve apostles, when the church was scattered, they remained, if you read the scripture there, they remained in Jerusalem. But the church body was scattered everywhere. Which is saying they also knew that they had a, they had a privilege and a responsibility of carrying the word of God wherever they went and spreading the gospel. And so then churches began to be formed in other areas other than Jerusalem. That's what the Lord had said <coughs> before they went anywhere. He said in Acts 1 8, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Stephenville, Texas, in the the surrounding states and all the world. It says Jerusalem, Judea, and then in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This is our Jerusalem. And we have been given the power to spread the gospel. Romans 10, 18 says, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their word unto the ends of the world. <clears throat> I believe that a lot of people is in hell because of people that would not let the gospel be preached. And say, so, well, why didn't God override that? God gave that people a responsibility privilege to accept what he had done. If you read the Bible, it talks about that. Where the Jews had that same mentality and refused to let the word be preached. And thus people did not be, hear the gospel. And you cannot believe in him whom you have not heard. They went preaching the word. They didn't go talking about the Dallas Cowboys and how much we need rain and snow or what. They went preaching the word. It's, it's uh, been given the responsibility. Uh, Paul said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, and I think we're in that time, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into, into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And then Paul goes on, I'm ready to be offered. I'm, I'm through, I fought a good fight, I've finished my course. So you do the work now. Carried on, Timothy. And they went with the blessing, even in persecution. They still saw people saved while they were being persecuted. It says in Acts 4 3, and, or beginning 4 3, as, and as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through uh, Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. How, how be it many of them which heard the word received, and listen to this, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Even while they're being persecuted and preaching, Word of God, 
And here's another case where there's more saved than there was on the day of Pentecost. It says about 5,000. And <clears throat> came to pass on the borrow that their rulers, builders, and scribes, and, and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and, and John, and Alexander, and as many of her kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And, and when they had set them in midst, they asked, what, By what power or by what name have you done this? And it's talking about the healing of an impotent man. And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people, the elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom you crucified, can you just imagine that? They're arrested. <laughs> whom God raised from the dead, even by him, both this, this man, uh, does this man stand here before you hold? This is a stone which was set at, at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Preaching under persecution. Uh, some people don't have the courage, courage and courtesy to stand up to the Lord like they should when they know there's only one way of salvation. I had a woman right out here. I got, my car got scraped by a pickup. An insurance agent came, our adjuster, and we got to talking and somehow or other led up to my son taking his life. And I said, uh, she said, what are you thinking about that? Where do you think he is? I said, well, I believe salvation is by grace through faith, that not yourself, it's still for God. And so I believe my son is in heaven. It, it's a sin to take your life, but sin has been paid for by Christ. She said, that's what I believe. And I kept talking to her name, Kim, and I wish I'd have got her last name because I bet she knows probably everybody in Morgan Mills. She lives up there. Her husband died a year ago. She told me about. In fact, she went on to tell me her in-laws had three sons, I think, and all three of them had died. I just, my heart just weeps with both mom and dad and their kids gone. But we was talking, I said, I believe when you accept Jesus Christ, and I talked about the birth, that you're born into the family. And I said, Kim, like you were born, your mom and dad can't ever be unborn. And so it is with salvation. Once you are born again, and I told her the word again comes from a Greek word means from above. Can't lose that. So, and I remember this, that I told them I'm taking my car to Campbell Auto Body, and if you heard their commercial, it says, where good people meet by accident. I told her, I said, you know what, this is for me and you meeting, so we can talk about our Lord. She said, I believe that's true. You helped me a lot. <laughs> so, Praise the Lord, you know, I may never see her again, but God put us together because of an accident. <laughs> I, I believe in things like that. <laughs> I, I don't sit around and cry over spilled milk. <clears throat> but anyway, over and again, if you read all that chapter, you find uh, Peter and John <coughs> standing up to the Lord and under persecution. It's kind of like Paul said, if I die, I die. I'm just going to preach the gospel. I had the whole chapter, but I'm not going to read it. <laughs> uh, but it's really good uh, if you have time to read the whole chapter forward. I like always verse 12. For neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. 
I love that verse. I love the one Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes in the Father but by me. Then I want to go to the next point, the success of the church. In Acts 4.33, it says, And with great power gave the apostle witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. They had gone back after being released, it says, to their own company, which was the church. Prayer had been made for them, and God really opened the door for them to win a lot of people. And they were active always in evangelizing. They carried out the Great Commission as it was given in four different places in Scripture. But Matthew 18, 28, 18 says, Jesus came to speak of them, saying, All power given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all uh, teach all nations. First of all, teach and then baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. And then teaching them, that's what you're doing, Charlie. That's what you do, Joe. That's what our Sunday school teachers are doing. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, then here's the promise. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the, of the world. Amen. That means Jesus said that's the way it will be and it cannot be any other way. So we have to realize that the church is to be uh, always having the blessings of God on it. Let's do a candlestick removed. It must go out, teach our Jerusalem, baptize those we preach, and then bring them in and teach them to observe all things by everything. So we've been called. And, uh, and that he's commanded us. They were united in the message. They were willing to serve. Romans 1, 14, Paul said, I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks, to the barbarians, both to the wise and unwise. So, as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, but I am not ashamed. The word ashamed means disappointed. It's not, I'm not disappointed in the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believes it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Motivation is important, isn't it? Why do you keep on keeping on? There's an incentive behind why they went on and why the church never stopped, and it's why we should never stop. In Luke 12, verse 35, it says, Let your loin be girded about, and your lights burning, and you yourselves liken the men that wait for their Lord when he will return from, uh, from the wedding, uh, that when he cometh and knocketh, they open unto him immediately. Then it says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. It's not talking about sitting <coughs> watching. It's talking about doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. They're doing it. He said, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto them, uh, To him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in the due season? Blessed is that servant. Listen to these words. Whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. The doing, wouldn't it be good? You're witnessing someone, maybe they just accepted Christ as the trumpet sounds. That's the doing. Or maybe in the doing is 
coming into this place where we are here and worshiping. But the motive because of the hope set before them. And closing the, in the First Thessalonians in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. The, li the, the li lively hope or the blessed hope is so very important. We know we're going to be raptured. We know we're going to be with the Lord. That's our hope. We anticipate it. We expect it. We're not looking at it like a maybe so thing. It's a real thing that's going to take place and we're waiting. First Thessalonians 1 verse 9 says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had of you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Even so come Lord Jesus. That should be the prayer of the church today. The world is crumbling, but while we're saying even so come Lord Jesus, let us be like the apostles, let's be like the first church, the spread of God. We, we haven't been persecuted yet, but let's spread it now and then if we are, he'll give us the grace to do it then too.